I wonder how many of you are in the middle of a pretty decent life for the most part, but still find yourself complaining a lot? <laughs> Why is that? That our lives can be pretty special most of the time and our minds can drift to the things that we don't like or the things we wanna complain about. What do we know about our minds? Our mind is a battlefield and most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. In other words, the life that we have in so many different aspects is a result of the thoughts that we think. What comes into your mind tends to come out in your life. If you have a negative mind, it's almost impossible to have a positive life when your mind is consumed with negative thoughts. I wanna to review today as we start our message on my book, Winning the War in Your Mind, I want to review a key thought from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through five. When the apostle Paul said this, he said, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, our weapons, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's a wrong pattern of thinking. Many of us are held hostage by the lies that we believe. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive. Somebody say, we take captive. Yeah. Type it in the chat, we take captive. What do we do? We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The title of today's message is Defeat Your Negative Thoughts. And with that, let's go before God in prayer. Father, we ask that by the power of your word and the presence of your spirit, you would renew our minds with truth. Demolish every stronghold, every argument, every pretension in our minds, God, that sets itself up against the knowledge of truth. Give us the power, God, to grab the negative, hurtful, toxic lies, capture them and replace them with truth. God, give us your mind that we can live according to your will. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen, amen. If you've been with us over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the power of the mind as God created the mind, the mind is so incredibly powerful and we talked about the reality that it's incredibly complex, but we have something that's called neural pathways. What's so interesting is every time you think a thought, you're actually creating patterns or pathways in your brain. And the more often you think a thought, the easier it is to think that thought again. I wanna expand on that idea today and introduce what will be a some idea to some of you. I wanna to talk to you about what people call cognitive biases, or it's often called a mental filter. Uh, what is a cognitive bias? A, a very simple definition for a cognitive bias is a mistake in reasoning based on personal experiences or preferences. It's a mistaken reasoning based on what you've experienced or, or what you prefer. We could call it a mental filter or a mental framework in your life. In other words, if you grew up in a context and you had something really bad happen to you, a lot of times you have a framework of thinking or a filter through which you might see a situation inaccurately. For example, um, maybe unfortunately there are many of you that grew up around very abusive men. And so because you were hurt and abused by men, now a lot of times when you see men, all men aren't hurtful and all of them aren't abusive, but because of what you endured, your filter tends to uh, shape how you see men. And because of what happened to you, oftentimes you may make an inaccurate judgment about someone around you. Or for example, you might've grown up with parents who said, uh, bad things about wealthy people. Like all wealthy people are bad, they're evil, they're whatever. And then you find yourself starting to succeed financially later in life and you might feel guilty or ashamed. And it's not that it's bad, but your filter shapes how you see it. The filters you have shape how you see life. What's interesting is if you change the filter, it often changes how you feel change the filter, changes the feel. And we know that uh, if you're posting 
a photo that's not very good on social media, but you change the filter. How many of you have ever done that before? I liked this picture that I had of um, Amy and me until one of my kids got a hold of it and changed the filter. And when you change the filter, it completely changes the feel, right? It's same, not just in a photo, but it's very true in your life. Change the filter, it changes the feel. What is a cognitive bias? A cognitive bias is what we might call a default filter. It's when our brain is pre-wired to think in a certain way or to pre, pre-wired to interpret a situation even if our interpretation isn't completely accurate. Uh, this is why two different people can respond totally differently to the exact same situation. It's not the facts that are different, what is it? It's the filter. For example, uh, you, you might be at your workplace and your supervisor might go and give the exact same feedback in the exact same way, almost in the exact same time to do two different people. And the way they receive the feedback can be very, very different. One person gets offended. Why are you telling me that? You don't know how valuable I am. I, I don't even like you anyway. Who do you think you are giving me that feedback? You don't know how, how much I bring to this company. And the next person with the same exact feedback and a different filter may say, well, thank you. That was really helpful. Now I can do a better job. I really appreciate the fact that you valued me. Thank you for that feedback. It's not the facts that are different. What is it? It's the filter. Type that in the chat. It's the filter. Uh, two different people can walk into a church, two people together, and one can walk in convinced that all Christians are hypocrites. I hate the music, this place is stupid, I never wanna come back. And right next to that person can be someone else who experiences the very same thing. That says, these people are amazing, they're so loving. I love the music, maybe I'm here because God wants me here. It's not the facts that are different, what is it? It's the filter. Uh, depending on what news sources you consume, you can read or watch some news sources and you can be convinced that the vaccine is the answer to every problem this year. Or if you read different sources, you can be convinced it's the most dangerous thing that will kill you and it probably has a chip in it to track you, right? It's not the, I know I'm getting into dangerous territory, but just work with me, okay? Just work, I know your side is right, whatever it is, you're right, I know you're right. Because I'm not informed, but you're right, okay? You're right. It's not the facts that are different, what is it? It's the filter, it's what you take in. You can see examples of this even through scripture. There's a powerful one, if you wanna read about this in the Old Testament, it's in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, when Moses sent 12 spies out to explore the land. 12 of them went out, saw the same exact thing, but the reports were entirely different. It wasn't the facts that were different, what was it? It was the filter. Two of them came back and said, oh my gosh, it's a beautiful, it's amazing, it's perfect. God has given us this, let's go take the land. 10 came back, which is funny to me, that it was 10 out of 12 that were negative, almost perhaps representative of hopefully not our church, but a lot of places out there where, there's, where it's way more easy to be negative, afraid and critical than it is to fight for a positive attitude. 10 came back and said, All right, this is dangerous. The land devours people, which is really funny. The land devours people and their giants and we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. What I promise you is nobody went up and interviewed one of these giants. What happened is their filter changed their perception of how they felt and they felt like grasshoppers in the eyes of everyone. It wasn't the facts that were different, what was it? It was the filter. But it's not just the filter that matters, it's also the frame. You can be in the very same situation and how you frame something determines how you see it. And I wanna give you a tool that I've worked with my counselor on that, that's called reframing. Let's adapt a tool called reframing and I'm gonna give you a simple definition of reframing. What does it mean to reframe a situation or reframe a relationship? Reframing is creating a different way of looking at a situation or relationship by changing its meaning. It's simply creating a different way of interpreting or looking at uh, a situation or a relationship by changing its meaning. 
and I'll give you an example of how you can reframe a day. Let's say you wake up and you determine ahead of time, this is gonna be a bad day. If you frame a day like this, you can say very easily, this is gonna be a hard day. I got so much to do today. I work with these people that drive me crazy today. I don't know how I'm gonna get it all done. I'm so overwhelmed, I'm so tired, life is hard, life is bad. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? My husband drives me crazy, these kids, why do we have all these kids? I'm sick of my stupid car, I hate the people I work with, I hate my job. The very same day, you can have a bad day if you frame it the wrong way. If instead you take the exact same situation and you reframe it, you may wake up and say, oh, I've got a lot going today, but I'm so thankful my God is with me. I'm thankful that he's for me. I'm thankful he's given me a job. I'm thankful for my old clunker that gets me to this job. Even though some people drive me crazy at work, I'm actually thankful for them because they're pretty good people. I believe today's gonna be a good day. We're gonna grind it out. We're gonna get a lot done. It's not the facts that change, but it's how you frame it. I'm afraid that there are so many people that start to frame even God by saying, I don't like what's going on, God, rather than looking for the goodness of God in the day. It's not just the facts that are different, it's often the filter or it's often the frame. And what do we know about what goes on in life? You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. You can't control what happens to you, but the good news is, you can control how you frame it. What I wanna do, is slow this down for just a moment and ask you to think about your life right now. Think even about the expectations that you often have in your mind. And I wonder how many of you wanted something in life, but right now you're experiencing the opposite. You thought that by this time I would be doing such and such, or I would be in this place, or I would have this, or I would have accomplished this, or I would have had this relationship. And you really, really wanted something, but instead of achieving or accomplishing or, or having or being where you wanted, instead you're maybe at the exact opposite. Maybe some of you, you dreamed about having a great marriage and that's exactly what you wanted and you prepared for it and you prayed about it and, and you were pure and you worked toward it with everything in you and you married your sweetheart and then years later you ended up where you never wanted to be, brokenhearted and divorced. Maybe for you, you went to college and studied and got the degree and felt like you were prepared to do something that would be meaningful. And now instead of being in a job that you love, you're in an unrelated job that seems like it's way beneath your education. And you wonder, how in the world did I get here? Maybe for you, it was that you got to a point in your life where you thought I'd be married or I'd be financially out of debt or I'd be able to travel or I'd have a ministry or I'd be making a difference or I'd be, I would have started my business or I'd be leading the business or my kids would have been better off. And you find yourself waking up going, why am I not where I wanted to be? and you're so confused by it. If you ever wake up and think, this isn't what I wanted, I wanted the exact opposite. The apostle Paul knows exactly what you feel like. In fact, his story is incredibly emotional to me because he had a heart for God and only wanted to serve God and only wanted to please God. And he felt called to go to Rome to preach the gospel. And he knew if he could reach the people in Rome, that would be the strategic place to help the gospel spread all over the world. So his dream, his bucket list, his top prayer list, his greatest desire, his calling was to go to Rome to preach. And instead of being in Rome preaching, he finds himself in Rome as a prisoner, locked up in house arrest, awaiting possible execution. Everything that he wanted and he got the exact opposite. Paul could have framed the situation in one of different ways. He could have framed it on the negative side, and this is what he would have said if he had framed it that way. From Philippians chapter one, verses 12 and 13, from the NWV version. NWV stands for the new whiners <laughs> version. He could have said this, he could have said, now I want you to know brothers and sisters that what's happened to me really sucks. 
as a result of all the hell I've been through, I'm quitting life group and I'm never going back to church. That's what he could have said in the NWV. Now, for those of you that are new to church, I just want you to know that's not a real version of the Bible. I just feel like I should say that. You're like on your U version about, where's the N N W V? I can't find it anywhere. It's my favorite version, okay? That's not real. <laughs> what he did though, is he reframed it. And I wanna read you the verse. This is what the verse says. He said, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, although it may really look bad to most people, it has actually served to advance the gospel. He said this, give me the next verse. He said, it's be, as a result, it's become clear to those in the palace guard, guess what? Even though it looks like I'm in bad shape, when I reframe it, it, it's clear to everyone else that I'm actually in chains for Christ. What's happening? I'm locked up to a Roman guard. Eight hours, every eight hours, I get a new one. Who do you think the real prisoner is here? I'm getting to preach to a captive audience and I get a new influential person every eight hours who has to sit there and listen to my eight hour sermon on how good Jesus is. Verse 14, he says this, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become even more confident in the Lord. And guess what? It looks bad, but because I'm in chains, they are daring to proclaim the gospel even more boldly without fear. It's not the facts that are different, it's how you frame it. And what I wanna to do today is I wanna to talk to you about how you can reframe your story and your relationships. Because what I know right now, many of you, you got a battle going on in your mind. Your life may have some complications. Guess what? We all do, we all have stuff. Every single one of us. There hadn't been a day without some stuff. It's stuff in your family, it's stuff with your kids, it's stuff with your neighbors, it's stuff with the people you work with. Stuff, 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 stuff. Bad doctor report stuff, bad behavior stuff, fighting with your spouse stuff, financial problem stuff, fear stuff, bad news on the news stuff, bad news in your family stuff, bad news in your extended family, stuff, 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 stuff. And so often, so much of life is generally pretty decent, but often it's the small part of the stuff that ends up taking us out of God's perfect will. I wanna to talk to you about reframing your story and relationships, and I'm gonna give you three specific tools that can help us renew our minds, win the war in our minds so God can change our thinking, which will change our life. Let me give you three really simple tools. The first thing is number one, is I wanna encourage you occasionally to thank God for what didn't happen. To thank God for what didn't happen. I'll give you an example of this. There was a, um, a 20 year old girl that said, mom and dad, I've got really bad news to tell you. I need you to sit down. And she said, let me tell the whole story and I just want you to stay calm, but it's really bad news. I went out to a bar, I met a guy, we drank too much, he came back to my apartment, we hooked up and I'm embarrassed to say I'm pregnant. The good news is that his probation will be over in a year and he's gonna start looking for a job once he's out of rehab. And he'll consider marrying me, but since we can't afford to get married now, he's just gonna move in right now. And she let it hang for a moment. Then she said, actually, none of that's true. The truth is I got a D on my chemistry exam, <laughs> and I just wanted you to know it could be a whole lot worse. <laughs> there may be a time where some of you ought to thank God for what didn't happen in your kid's life, right? It, I don't know what it would be, but maybe you uh, missed your goal at work and you had a, a target so you could get your bonus and you ended up not getting your bonus. And you feel devastated by that. But you can thank God that in a very challenged and compromised economy that you didn't actually lose your job and suddenly you're reframing the situation rather than just focusing on what's wrong, you can actually see what's right. You might get in a car wreck. Uh, one of my kids not too long ago would get a little fender bender. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be expensive and there's an insurance hassle and a deductible and we're not gonna be in a car. Or you can say, you know what? Thank God nobody got hurt. 
Thank God that it wasn't that big of a deal. In the whole scheme of things, there are some things that are a big deal, but so often it's things that aren't that end up taking us off. And if you'll take a step back every now and then and look with a broader perspective, instead of focusing on what you hate, you may just change the frame and say, God, I thank you for what didn't happen. There are so many good things, I'm not gonna let this one category take me off of being encouraged by your will. Thank God for what didn't happen. The second thing you can do is practice what we call pre-framing. Pre-framing, deciding how you'll frame a situation before you engage in the situation. Why does this matter? Because our thoughts or frames often shape what we experience. If you go in and say, this meeting's gonna be horrible. I hate these people. It's so dull. You think you're gonna have a good meeting? You're gonna have a bad meeting. If you go in instead and say, you know what? We're gonna do our best. We're gonna be productive. We're gonna enjoy the people that we're around. It's gonna change. Oh, we're going out. I hate all this. I hate these stupid events. It's gonna be a pain. These people. Oh, you know what? I'm thankful I'm with some people that I love. We're gonna have a good time. The way you frame it often changes how you perceive it. And I'll give you an example of how I reframed a failure. Uh, back in high school, one of the sports I played was tennis. And I've got some pictures of, uh, evidently all I knew how to do was hit a backhand in the pictures. But I, uh, I, my sophomore year, I played number one singles for a little Ardmore, Oklahoma. And in the state finals, I was in the quarterfinals, I was playing against the number four ranked seed, a guy named Mandy Ochoa, who was a legend. So I'm an unranked, unseated nobody against a senior, I'm a sophomore, and he was a legend. And somehow we split sets, one set to him, one set to me. In the third set, I was up five games to one, 40 love against the number four ranked player in the state. Big crowd, massive crowd of like 12 people gathered to watch this potential <laughs> upset. And I, if I won any of the three next points, they're called match points. You win any one and I win the match. Well, I didn't win those, he went on to do this. I ended up having seven match points in the third set. I was up 5-1, 40 love with seven match points. I lost them all and Mandy Ochoa came back to beat me 7-5 in the third set. Oh. <laughs> and I developed a reputation and a nickname called Grochoka. If Groschel gets in a tight match, he's gonna tighten up and he's gonna choke. And I started to own a very negative label. Thankfully, I had a great mentor and a coach who uh, sometime later got up into my business and essentially, he didn't use this term, but essentially he said, we're gonna reframe that. What I want you to realize is you've been in some of the tightest matches around and what have you learned? I said, I learned what doesn't work. <laughs> he said, what doesn't work? Whenever you get tense, whenever you don't hit out. So what do you do in a tight match? He said, he said ask me, he said, you go for it. You bring more into it. You let loose, you bring your, you bring your energy, you, you, you exhale and you, you, you bring your best, you bring your all. And he said, what I want you to do is essentially reframe your situation because of your experience now, you are prepared to become a great pressure player. That very simple little thing, I'm telling you, I was just a kid. It has stayed with me to this day. Hey, I may, have, I may have choked in some tight situations, but listen to me, because of my experience, God has enabled me to be great under pressure. In the most complicated leadership situations, when I visualize how I will lead, I never see myself choking, never see myself failing. I see myself walking in with the power of God, His Spirit within me, completely confident. I will lead well because I'm a pressure player. I've already pre-framed it. Some of you, you're pre-framing your failure before you ever get there. Take whatever shortcoming you have, learn from it, pre-frame it and walk in believing that God will enable you to be successful. What can you do? You can thank God for what didn't happen. You can pre-frame a situation. And the third thing is you can look for God's goodness. You can look for God's goodness because I promise you, you will always find what you're looking for. 
If you look for the good, you can find good. If you look for the bad, you'll find bad. If you wanna see what's wrong every single day, you can find what's wrong every single day. If you wanna not like people, you can find a ton of reasons to not like people. But if you wanna look for God, if you wanna see faith, if you wanna see the best, you can. It's just like the difference between a vulture and a hummingbird. What does a vulture find? Every day, vulture flies around. What does a vulture find? Dead stuff dead things, roadkill. But what does a hummingbird find? Every day the hummingbird finds sweet things. I promise you, you'll always find whatever you're looking for. If you wanna see what's wrong, what's bad, what's not working, what's wrong with the world, you can live a really depressed, negative life. But instead, if you wanna look for where God is working, you can see he's still on the throne <laughs> and he's still good and he's still powerful and he still answers prayers. It's called cognitive reframing. And a good therapist will do a tool with you. Cognitive reframing is, is empowering you to decide the meaning of an event. You decide. I'm gonna take it up a level and say this. Let's not just do cognitive reframing where you decide, but let's let Jesus help you decide the meaning of a situation. Let's let Jesus frame it for you. And I'll show you um, what this means to me. Uh, Amy and I were at an event recently. I spoke at a pastor's event with, um, there were probably 100, 125 pastors of um, what, what would be considered the most prominent churches in the country. Many of you would know um, many of the pastors who were there. And what's interesting is almost to every single one, uh, when we talked privately, they said, last year was the worst year ever. And their spouses talked to Amy going, it was, it was the worst year ever. And there was just this, this heaviness and this, um, a, a sense from some almost of hopelessness of how do we recover in the church world. And I looked back over last year and have had those thoughts and every single one of you in your own way had your own version of this. And so I don't wanna pretend like my year was worse than yours, but you had some version. My version was, you know, quarantined as like one of the first people in the country back in February. And then the church shut down and there's this massive fear of like, what do you do when you can't meet? How do you even navigate through that for almost three months? Then there was the, well, if you reopen, you're dangerous, was what some of you thought. If you don't reopen, you got no faith, is what others of you thought. And then there was the whole mask thing, like meaning if you wear a mask, you're a flaming liberal. If you don't wear a mask, you're dangerous to the world. And I mean, we're talking about like hatred from Christians. And then there was the, um, the growing awareness of the racial tension. And even with the purest of intentions of trying to love people well, it doesn't seem like any of us got that exactly right. Then the political divide, which we all know so well. And here we find ourselves in the middle of a very difficult situation looking going, this was the worst year ever. Or was it? Because when I started looking back through my old pictures on my phone, I didn't see any of that bad stuff. And I'll show you just a small glimpse of what I saw. I was one of the first people quarantined and I was exposed to the virus in Germany in February, came back and for 14 days, didn't see Amy. This is the closest I got to her is, is this photo. This is me, the guy on the right down the bottom with a mask on and a shirt over his head. For some reason, I thought that would help the virus from jumping across the yard to get her. And, and I'm telling you right now is, um, it was the most intimate, spiritual, meaningful time with Amy we FaceTimed and talked from across the house and I fell more in love with her, not being with her. And it's amazing how much I loved her. Then my married daughters were quarantined back in like March and April. I don't know what they were doing, but somehow <laughs> we ended up getting these two amazing little blessings. And then at church, we had some restructuring, which enabled my son-in-law Luke to get promoted to a youth pastor job at his church in the greater Tulsa area. And Anna and Luke bought their first house and they didn't have a baby, they had a dog. 
And then this is, it doesn't mean anything, but Amy learned to cut hair, which I thought was funny. But I got more time with my kids. And instead of working out in the gym, I worked out with my sons and had more time with them. And then I had what I call Adventures with Joy, where we went all over the place and we found some sort of a skull here. We're not sure if it's a cow head or a dinosaur head. We think it's probably a dinosaur head. But as I look back over the last year, it's easy at first glance to think it was the worst year ever. But actually I see so many incredible blessings when I reframe it. And when you look at the church that had to close down for months and yet, and then attendance is like half of what it used to be. But somehow in the middle of